will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bowls will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bowls will sing.
truck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Yeah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Yeah. And all creation I sing, praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. Oh, yeah. epistles you are you can write your laws on our hearts so that we can be known and read of all men oh hallelujah 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 Lord we honor you in this place we exalt you in this place we 
Lord, without you, we can do nothing. We need your strength, your power, your guidance, your direction. And we welcome you here, Lord. And Lord, we thank you that you speak to us and our ears are attentive to your words. For I am doing a new thing, says the Lord. I'm calling you to a new and living way with a new anointing and fresh oil. I've got plans to prosper you, not to harm you, but to give you an expected end. Draw near to me, says the Lord, and I will draw near to you. I will make myself known to you. I will strengthen you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Someone say praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You guys may be seated. Do you have enough to eat? Amen. Well, now you're ready to feed your spirit. Hallelujah. You know, the Bible says those who hunger and thirst after God, they, they shall be filled. Hallelujah. But we're glad you're here. And uh, just want to let you know, guys, I think Stephen mentioned it, but if you want to take a rocket home, uh, whoever would like to take a rocket home, you can take it home. All right. I don't think it'll take you home, but you can take it home. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I'll tell you what, we are just so glad that you're here and uh, God is here. Amen. Are you guys ready to go a little deeper? You guys ready to go into another level today? Amen. Well, we're going to uh, see this video uh, right before uh, Pastor John comes and, and speaks to us. All right, so get your hearts ready and uh, let me know when it's uh, ready. All right. before. A couple of you have. I call that video justice. <laughs> but what it does is it introduces what I'm going to talk about today and uh, this morning. And uh, a number of years ago, the Lord gave me these words and he said this to me. I didn't fully comprehend it, uh, but I comprehend it today and I see it today like never before. He said, every, every Christian, every person who calls himself a Christian, who identifies as a Christian, is either a contender or a pretender. They're either in the fight or they're identifying and acting like they're in the fight. As I began to look at that and clearly see that from what the Lord said to me, 
The Lord, when he talks to me like that, he always gives me a scripture. Because the Lord is reminding us, actually the Holy Spirit is reminding us of things he's already said. And that's what Jesus says the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit reminds us of what God has already said. There's nothing that God has never said. The only thing he's yet to say is to you or to me is well done, thou good and faithful servant. Or what he's going to say on judgment day. But as far as what God has said, he has said it already. Many people that identify as Christians, they have this mentality that, well, if I do this, then God's going to do this. Sorry, God's not waiting for you to move. Meaning, Jesus is at rest in heaven. He's not waiting for you to do something so he can be the wizard of heaven and start pulling some levers behind the curtain somewhere. The Bible says he's at rest. He's seated. He's seated. He's not up there in a workshop somewhere. This is not the Santa of heaven. He's already seated. He's seated on the throne. Come on, somebody. He's seated at the right hand of God. He's seated in a place of honor, a place of victory. And what is he doing? He's ever making intercession for us. Jesus is always speaking the word over us. That's what, that's what that word intercession means. Intercession doesn't mean, well, he has all these random thoughts about us, you know, and just talks about us. No, he's speaking the word. He's washing up with, with the water by the word. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. Now, I, I, I want to I make sure that I have your attention. All right? Breakfast is over. I want to make sure I have your attention this morning. Undivided attention is the worst thing in the body of Christ. If you've ever had children, which many of you have, you know that undiv undivided attention is, you know, distractions. And that's what the enemy tries to do in the church today. Distraction, distraction, distraction. And what happens is we chase the shiniest object in the room. And that's what we're looking at. Because the devil knows of our short attention span. But it shouldn't be. When we were in the world, we didn't have a short attention span. So I want you to, I want you to focus, and that'll, that'll save us some time, because I'm going to say what I need to say today. We're in a fight, guys. We're in a fight. We didn't pick the fight. We didn't choose the fight. But we're in a fight. Men are under assault, as anybody noticed. Manhood is under attack. Masculinity is under attack. Come on. They're trying to demasculinize our boys. It's working. I said it is working, unfortunately. When I was in the airport flying here, I flew through Dallas-Fort Worth, and I walked by a male that was identifying as a female, dressed like a female. And he was coming right at me, and I, I couldn't help but say as I walked by him, wow, wow. Our masculinity is under attack. Our boys, our manhood is under attack. Come on, somebody. Now, it's so serious. It's so serious. It's so current. It's so in our face that I just saw this the other night. I was not planning on it. I wasn't watching it. I walked in my hotel room in Florida after a men's meeting at night. We had 200 men there. And I'd just spoken with the pastor at dinner after the meeting of some things that I've been researching and looking at with regard to concerted attacks, meaning 
groups coming together to attack manhood and men of our nation. Boys, young men, to neuter us. One of the side effects of the COVID vaccine is a great reduction in the sperm count in men. You think that's by, by happenstance? You think that's by surprise? No. Pharma is working in concert with the powers that be, driven by the Antichrist spirit, to do what? To take out the head. Now watch this. I want to show, I want to show you something. I've got scripture for you. I got scripture for you. This is the one you're talking about, right? And we're going to look at scripture. We're just going to look at two scriptures this morning. But you see, God has established his authority in the earth through entities or avenues. He could not just speak authority into the earth, right? He could not just say it or speak it and create it with his words. Pastor Doug, authority on you. No, he creates avenues, vehicles by which his authority operates. So he created in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, he created authority in the home. We know he created authority in the church. He put authority in the church to teach us spiritual authority. Thirdly, he created government for the purpose of establishing the rule of law in the earth, etc., etc. And this is what I want you to see. Without doing a great long Bible study, this is really easy math. You don't even have to take off your shoes to figure this out. For those of you who didn't get that, I mean, you know, this is easy to count. You don't need extra digits to find. The enemy has no authority in the earth. I've actually had pastors argue with me about that. Not many. This is easy. In Matthew 28, say it with me, Matthew 28. Matthew 28. Jesus said, say Jesus said. Do you believe what Jesus said? Yes. Well, in Matthew 28, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Do you think he shared any of that authority with the devil? I want you to think about that for a moment. Who did Jesus give authority to? The church. He didn't share it with the devil. The devil has power, but he doesn't have authority. Now, I'm going to relate this to you. I just told you Matthew 28. I'm going to give you another scripture, Luke 10, 19. Say Luke 10, 19. Luke 10, 19, Jesus is responding to the 70 disciples that he had sent out into the villages, the neighborhoods, the highways, the cities to cast out devils and heal the sick. Not the 12, but the 70, a different, a different group of disciples. They came back, and it says, they came back with joy and said unto Jesus, 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 even the devils were subject unto us by your name. Subject, under, sub, under, Right? They had to move under, is relating to movement or positioning. 
They had to position themselves under us. Well, that applies to what the Bible says, that the devil is under where? Our feet. The devil is under our feet. If that was true of those 70 disciples who weren't even born again, think about it. They weren't born again yet. They weren't spirit-filled. What's wrong with the church today, 2,022 years later? Why aren't we walking in our authority? When they had a lesser level of authority, but yet they walked in it. Hello? J just thinking out loud here. Uh, did those 70 have one of these? What's wrong with us? What's wrong with the church of 2022? We're still defeated, still succumbing to the devil's devices and tricks and strategies of deceit. Here's why, and I'm going to talk about this tomorrow morning, because we don't know who we are. We don't really know who we are. If we know who we are, I'm going to be Pastor Frank for a moment. None of you men would have had your hands beside you while we were worshiping God a moment ago. If we know who we are, when we sing that song called the Revelation song, we come out of our shoes. Come on. First time I heard that song was in Minneapolis, Minnesota. On the radio, on my rental car. As I was returning it back to the Minneapolis airport, I fueled up at Sam's Wholesale Club in Bloomington, Minnesota. And that was on the radio. And I had that radio on. And I don't normally do this. I don't do, do like a lot of the young people and other people do, to, do today. They come in and fill up and roll down their windows and blast their, their hip-hop and all their vulgar music. Well, I just decided I still want to hear this song because it's a word song. It's the first time I ever heard it. And this is many years ago now. And I'm pumping gas. And I'm singing that song, and I, I, don't have, I don't even have the lyrics, but I know this is a word song. I know this is a, this is a Bible song. And I just began to lift my hands to God as my gas is pumping, and people are looking at me driving by. I don't care. I'm worshiping my God. What, what are we doing? What are we doing? We're the church of Jesus Christ. What do we have to be ashamed of? Hello? While I was in Florida, I was there two different weekends. The pastor of one of the churches is a, is a big Florida State fan, and there was somebody in his church that gave him two tickets to the Florida State Clemson game, and so we went. You know, those football fans... They're unashamed of their team. They paint themselves up like Seminoles, you know, the Florida State Seminoles. They paint themselves up. They wear, they wear attire, not just shirts and polos and T-shirts and jackets. They, they, they wear the whole uh, Indian, Seminole Indian attire. They're unashamed fan, which is short for fanatic. They're unashamed fanatics. When will the church be unashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ, where we will worship God openly and freely and show the world? We call them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but their real names, their Hebrew names are Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. We don't call Daniel Belshazzar. That's what Nebuchadnezzar and the Chaldeans named him. 
But we don't call Daniel Belshazzar. We call him Daniel. So why do we call these guys by their Chaldean name when their names, their given names, their godly names are Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael? They were unashamed of God. Again, they're not born again. They don't have a Bible. They don't carry around the scroll of Isaiah with them. Huh? They're not born again. They're not spirit-filled. But they would not bow to the idols of the day. Do you know that we have more idols today than they did in that day? We read the Old Testament. We, man, oh, that's a weird place. All those idols, those golden images. Are you kidding me? We have far more idols today that men and women are worshiping. Every, every Saturday, people worship at the altar of college football. Every Sunday, people worship at the uh, altar of NFL. And I don't mean just going to the games. I mean, you got, you got to have all these screens going on. And they fill up the bars and they fill up all these places. Same thing in baseball. Same thing in any sport. Idols. Now listen to me. I played college football at two D Division I schools. I played with and against some not only all Americans in college, but also all pros in the NFL, future all pros. I get it. I, I get it. But it's become an idol. Idol worship. People will, they'll do anything to, to but watch their game, but they don't have time for church, and they certainly don't have time for a Saturday men's conference. Some people, they idolize Friday night football. I played football in high school at the school that they wrote the book and the movie Friday Night Lights about. My home stadium hosts 28,000 people. That's high school. I won the, we won the state championship in 1972. I played with and against some amazing players that went on to become, become all Americans in NCAA Division I football, all pros in the NFL, et cetera, et cetera. I could just go on and on about this. But my point is, I get it. I get it. That doesn't mean I can't enjoy sports, that I can't watch sports. That I, I watched the end of the, 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 the Astros-Phillies game last night, and the Phillies were behind five to nothing, and they came back and won the game six to five in the 10th inning. Amazing. I have friends that were at, they call it the juice box in uh, Houston. It's Minute Maid Park, you know, sponsored by Minute Maid. But they call it the juice box. I have friends that were at the juice box. I looked for them on the television. Didn't find them. It was a sea of humanity. There were thousands upon thousands of people inside and then thousands and thousands of people outside. And then they kept showing the Phillies highlights. They kept showing bars in Philly that were filled and arenas in Philly that were filled with people watching the game. And, of course, self-medicating. My point is, if people can be that committed to something that is so temporary in life and so fickle, but yet we can't lift our hands and lift our voices to God, and we can't, we can't come and learn more about him. And that's why times like this are so important. But, men, I'm challenging you this morning to understand that we're under attack. Manhood itself, masculinity itself is under attack. Now, I grew up in a rodeo cowboy's home, a professional rodeo cowboy. My dad is in the Texas Rodeo Cowboy Hall of Fame. He's in the Pro Rodeo Cowboy Hall of Fame in Colorado Springs. He's in the 
National Cowboy Hall of Fame in Oklahoma City, and he's in many of the regional city rodeo hall of fames around the country because he was a champion. That was back long before they had logos and sponsorships. If you didn't write eight seconds and score highly, you didn't get a check. In fact, you lost money because you paid an entry fee to ride that bull or that horse or wrestle that steer or rope that calf. You paid an entry fee, and that's a lot of where they get their prize money in that day from the entry fees. They didn't have sponsors like they have today. Today, you don't even have to ride eight seconds to get a check. Your sponsors are going to pay you a lot of money just for being on television because every time they show that logo... You know, I got one logo on my shirt. Every time, every time they show that logo, and, the, you know, they got logos on, they got one on this collar, one on that collar, one on the back of this one, all, all over their flak jacket. They got one on their hat now. They got one on their riding glove. They got logos everywhere on their shaps. They got logos everywhere on their boots, on their belt buckles. They got logos everywhere, and every time that's shown, ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. That's why golfers do it, pro sports do it. That's why you watch those NASCAR races. You watch those NASCAR races. <laughs> and they primarily put those logos on those cars. There's scores of logos on those cars. They put them where the TV cameras are going to see them. Because they get paid. And the more that you're in the lead, the more you get paid because you're going to be on TV more. So there's actually software developed, used to be individuals, that would sit and watch every sporting event and count the number of seconds or minutes that your logo was seen on national television, and then you got paid accordingly. Now software is developed that, that does that. But there's probably still somebody overseeing it. My point is, my dad had to be really good to get in the Hall of Fame because he didn't have sponsorship. But my dad didn't make it in the Husband Hall of Fame or the Dad Hall of Fame. Of all the sporting events I ever participated in, Little League, Elementary, Junior high, high school, college, my dad never appeared at one of them. Not one practice, not one game, not one championship, not one state. Didn't even bother to watch my state championship game on live television all over Texas. It's not that big a deal to see high school games on TV today. It was a big deal to see that in 1972. In our locker room that day, we won the, we won the game 37-7, to 7, University of Texas Memorial Stadium. We played at all the D1 school, we, school uh, stadiums. We played at both pro stadiums. We played at the Astrodome. We played at Texas Stadium where the Cowboys used to play. We had 55,000 fans there at that stadium in a high school game. We chartered Southwest Airlines jets in high school to go to our playoff games. You know, Texas is a big honking state. Don't know if, don't know if you, you really know how big it is. But El Paso, Texas, is closer to San Diego, California than it is to Dallas, Texas. It's out there. I lived in West Texas. I still live in West Texas. And where I lived in Odessa, Texas, is still 288 miles to El Paso. So my, my point is, it was a big honking deal, and my dad never even bothered to turn on the television. Never bothered to show up. It wasn't because he couldn't afford it, because my dad earned and won millions of dollars in his career. But he died broke. You see, I understand what tough guy is. I understand what masculinity is all about. I understand what machismo is, macho. I live in West Texas. Are you kidding me? 60% of our, our city is Hispanic. I get it. 
I worked in the oil field. I worked at offshore drilling rigs. I was in the locker rooms. I worked construction all over Houston and all over Texas. Still do construction stuff. I get, I get machismo. But just because you're macho doesn't make you godly. Come on, somebody. Now, I, I get tough guy. I grew up on a horse. I grew up roping cattle, branding cattle when I was three years old. I get tough guy. We ate, my brother and I, we cut, we cut calf nuts. You can't say that from the pulpit. That's why I came over here. <laughs> and there's a skillet with Crisco in it at the branding iron fire. We threw them in there, breaded them, threw them in there, and then we ate them. I get tough guy. And you had blood coming down, blood coming down the corner of your mouth when you bit into them. I get tough guy. Tastes like chicken. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Not. But my, my point is, I, I get all that. Are you kidding me? In the oil field? You think everything's holy in the oil field? You think everything's holy in the construction uh, zones uh, around a mega city like Houston, the fourth largest city in the country? No. You think it's holy in the locker rooms? No. I understand how rough and tough things get. But that doesn't make a man. What makes a man is submission to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Pastor said it last night. Jesus is not only the king of kings and the lord of lords. He's a man of men. Because of our background with Catholicism and Michelangelo and all these paintings and all these Bible story books and stuff, they, they make Jesus out as this. Come on. Effeminate, wimpy looking guy. He was a man's man. Remember, he's a carpenter's son. That meant what did he do as a young man? He toted lumber. He worked with his hands. He got down and dirty. Come on, somebody. We don't, we don't have all that history, but we know he was a carpenter's son. He wasn't just going through life. Blessings. Peace be unto you. But they've effeminized him. Catholicism has effeminized him. Michelangelo uh, effeminized Jesus. He's not effeminate. He's a man. And we've got this mentality that if I'm a believer, I have to check my masculinity at the door. No, you don't. You'll become more of a man when you chase Jesus Christ. My Bible says the righteous are as bold as a what? A lion. Not a meow. Not a kitty cat. What are we doing? In 2022, when we've got this, it says right over here, accurately, accurately stated, this is not a holly Bible. This is God's word. This is God's word. What are we doing? I've already read the Bible. I ate yesterday too, but I'm going to eat again today. I need more feeding Come on, I need more spiritual nourishment and life flow in my life. You see, my spirit, man, eats and is nourished by the word. Most people just have their little cherry-picked pet scriptures, and they don't know enough to where if they were of the word of God, if they were incarcerated for being a Christ follower, they would be found not guilty. I don't identify myself as a Christian anymore. It's only used two times in the New Testament, by the way. I identify myself as a Christ follower. That's used scores of times in the New Testament. And it specifically identifies what we're supposed to be doing. Christian has become this watered-down version and has actually become, in many places, a political statement.
you identify as a Christian in many cases, you're pigeonholed into this position of lame brain, weak-minded. Come on. But when you say you're a Christ follower, I follow Christ, that's a whole different mentality. And that's more of a Bible term than Christian is. 74% of Americans identify as Christian. The word Christian means like Christ. I don't think that 74% of Americans are acting like Christ. It literally means the word Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's his title, anointed one. Christian means little anointed one. Last time I checked, you know, I fly all this country. I, I'm in seven states just this, just this month. I was in five states last month. I fly over the, all over this country, and I'm not seeing 74, 75%. I'm not seeing 10% of Americans acting like little anointed ones. They're acting more like big doofuses instead of little anointed ones. Come on. Now here's what I want you to see here. The devil doesn't have the authority to come and snuff you out anytime he wants. If he did, you'd already be snuffed out before you ever heard the gospel, before you ever got born again. So what does he do? He has to come through the channels of authority that God ordained, these three. You want to know why the home is under attack? You, you want to know why marriage is being redefined? Because of this right here. Because the devil is trying to break down and undermine godly authority in the earth. In other words, he was not successful, last time I checked my Bible, he was not successful at undermining godly authority directly in heaven. He got the boot. Right? So what is he doing? He's trying to undermine godly authority through God's delegated authority. Us. The home, the church, and government. Now listen to me. He's been successful. Let me write a number on this board that absolutely identifies what I'm talking about. It's a big number. That's a big number. 88%. It represents the percentage of born again, spirit filled young people coming out of churches like this going to university and 88% of them toss their faith to the curb when they get in the university and get reindoctrinated. What does that tell me? It tells me, number one, the devil is after our young people. That the devil is trying to undermine godly authority. Number two, it tells me that we're not doing our job at home. Maybe that surprised you. Thirdly, it tells me we're not doing our job at the church. But ministry doesn't start at the church, it starts at home. But here's the biggest thing it tells me, the biggest thing it tells me. It tells me that our men that identify as Christians have abdicated their role as a spiritual head. I have children. I have seven grandchildren. 
And all of them are serving God. It's not because I made them. It's because I led them. We can go all the way back to the book of beginnings. Where God was looking for a man. God was looking for a man. He wasn't looking for a woman. Thank God for our women. We wouldn't even have churches in many cases if it wasn't for our women. But our men, I'm talking about the history of the church now. History was one of my minors in college. And I even studied church history in a secular university. You can't look through real history without knowing things about the church. And I saw something very eye-opening, especially in our country, that was created for God. God created Israel for man, but man created the United States of America for God. And it's in our Constitution and our Declaration of Independence. But we've gotten so far from that. Our nation used to be ex entirely godly. Pastor and I were talking about this, about the original Ivy League schools, including Penn, Hale, uh, Yale, Harvard, and, and what? Princeton, thank you. They were all divinity schools. You first went to divinity school before you went to university. In other words, you became an ordained minister before you got your bachelor's of science or your master's, et cetera, et cetera, because they were teaching and training ministers. They're far from it today. It's still in some of their logos, Bibles and crosses, but they're so far from that today. I've been on all these campuses, and they're beautiful places, but their spirits are evil there now. They used to be... Back, back when I was a young man, there was still a presence of God in some of them, but no, no more. Why? Because it's become so woke. Why? Why? Because of that attack against the home, the church, and government. The enemy, I, that's why I said he's been successful. He's infiltrated. He's infiltrated to undermine godly authority starting in the home, then the church, and then through government, which would include the schools, He's undermined godly authority in the earth. And we're operating from behind now. We've got to turn this thing around, guys. And it's going to be us. It's not just going to be our intercessor prayer, prayer, prayer teams. It's going, to have, it's going to have to be us as men. We're going to have to stand up and be godly men again. Come on, somebody. We're going to have to stand up and be counted. We're going to have to be unashamed to worship God and to shine the light because we are not only the light, we are the salt of the earth. But we've lost our savor. We've lost our penetrating power to purify. That's what salt was used for. We've lost that penetrating power. I'm telling you where we're at. I'm telling you, that's where we're at. We can't get to where we need to go until we realize where we're at. You can't use your phone as a GPS device to find out your map where you need to go if you don't let it know where you are now. Anybody remember an old-fashioned map? Anybody know what that is? Okay. <laughs> you can find all kinds of places to go, but if you don't know where you are, how are you going to get there? So that's what I'm identifying today. This is where we're at. Our churches have become wimpy. Our preachers have become wussies. My brother and I were not raised in church. When my parents separated because my dad refused to pay child support and because he would not send home any... Uh, Monies from his earnings, and he's winning all this money. In 1950, my dad was winning the Madison Square Garden day money. My mom still has the check stubs. $1,900, $2,000, dollars a day in 1950. Think about it. 
I wouldn't mind getting $2,000 a day today. But in 1950, that's a fortune. And we gamble it all away. My dad died 10 years ago and still had a gold nugget ring with a diamond horseshoe given to him by Billy Binion, the son of the famous Golden Horseshoe Casino in Las Vegas. I said, Dad, where'd you get that ring? He said, oh, they gave it to me. I said, so they're, they're in the habit of at Vegas and Atlantic City of giving away free gold nugget and diamond rings? Yeah, and they gave me a free hotel room and free food too. Oh, so it's just free? That's like I have to tell my wife, there's no such thing as free shipping, honey. UPS and FedEx and USPS are not giving away free shipping. You're paying for that. Your five easy payments are paying for that. Come on, somebody. There's no such thing as free hotel rooms in Vegas. There's no such thing as, as a free buffet. There's no such thing as, as, as a free gold nugget diamond ring in Vegas. You're paying for it because you're losing money right and left. They will gladly... How's you for free to take your money out of your pocket? I don't know if you've ever been in a casino or not, but there's ATMs everywhere. There's ATMs in the men's restroom. I kid you not. They're going to steal your money. They don't build those multi-million, even billion-dollar buildings now for free just so you can come and watch the fountains. <laughs> You're paying for that. Have we become so gullible that we just believe all the advertising? Back to my point. My brother and I were not raised in church. We didn't have Bibles. My parents never opened the Bible. They never prayed a moment's prayer with us. And we would see Christians at school, even though we were living in the projects of Dallas and Fort Worth, we would see our friends at school that were Christians, and they were such wimps. We were from the hood. We're athletes. We didn't want to identify as wimpy. Hmm? You know that God doesn't want you to identify as wimpy? God's not wimpy. Jesus is not a wuss. Jesus is not wimpy. Why, why do we want to identify? And the only preachers we knew were sissies. And they were even effeminate. So there's no way. We're not interested. And then there's a man's man that came to our public schools in 1969. He was 6'4", had a big booming voice like this that captured our attention. I still remember cheesier jokes than we heard last night. <laughs> that he had. His girlfriend was so skinny that she had to run around the shower to get wet. It was, she, she was sitting in class one day and got a runner in her pantyhose, and she fell right out of the hole. I mean, just real cheesy stuff. But we all laughed. But that man talked about life that we knew we didn't have. It was a man that had a worse testimony than we did with a drunk, drug-addicted mom. That was our mom. With a deadbeat dad that didn't pay child support, that never came to visit us. This macho cowboy 
Marine in Korea. Tough guy. But too macho to ever hug us and tell us he loved us. And he never did until I was in my 40s. And every time I saw him, I gave him a big hug. He'd always stick out his hand like this to try to keep me. But I got bigger than him really fast. And so I would grab his hand and I would pull him into me and I'd bear hug him. Dad, I love you. Not because I felt it, but because I knew it was right. Because my Bible says, say my Bible says, says. to honor your father and mother. I, 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 be, I believe, I believe that may be on those Ten Commandments at the front door. I believe that may be one of those. It says, this, in Ephesians, it says, this is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And I told God at the time, they don't deserve honor. You know what God said to me? I didn't see that footnote at the bottom of the page. There's no number or asterisk that says at the bottom of the page, only if they deserve it. Honor them only if they deserve it. So we're commanded. It's a commandment. It's the first commandment with a promise. Then it may be well with you and you'll live long on the earth. See, we've missed all this. We've missed this. Well, that man stood up before us, and he had a worse testimony than us. He was the son of a prostitute. He's a product of rape. And the only reason he was alive and birthed is because his mom missed her abortion appointment because of the flu. And three weeks later, James Robinson was born. And James is still in our lives. In 1969, James Robinson was still a fire-breathing, judgmental Baptist evangelist. Now he's spirit-filled. He's a he's big teddy bear. He's still bold, but he's a big teddy bear. But in 1969, he was anything but a teddy bear. But you know what? That's exactly what these street boys needed. It's exactly what these jocks needed. It's exactly what these project project boys needed. And three nights later, we walked the aisle and gave our hearts to Christ. We've never been the same since. We still needed pastoring. That's a whole different story. We still needed pastoring. And after three weeks of the Baptist church, we figured out we weren't going to get pastored at the Baptist church because they actually gave us New Testaments much smaller than this, pocket New Testaments. We were actually reading our New Testament Every day, even in class, we'd get our schoolwork done and we're reading our, we're reading our New Testament. And we'd come home and, and compare. We're at different schools. we come home and compare what we're reading that day and we get deeper and deeper. And that supplanted alcohol in our lives. That supplanted pot and, and pills in our lives as, as young men. It filled us up and it gave us a passion for what the Spirit of God said earlier, the plans and the purposes that he gave us are not for evil but for good, to give us an expected end, to give us a blessed life. Gentlemen, that's what this word and that's what this relationship is about. Jesus said it this way, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy, and, 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 not or, and. The enemy doesn't do one out of three, two out of three. He does all three every time. That's why Paul said later, give, neither give any place to the devil. If you give him any place, he's going to come in and steal and kill and destroy from room number one. And then he's going to go to room number two and steal and kill and destroy from that one. Then he's going to go to your kid's room and steal and kill and destroy. And that's what the 88% represent. And as men, we've abdicated our role as the spiritual head of the home. We've outsourced that, first of all, to the wife. Secondly, maybe to the church. Thirdly, maybe to the Christian school or to the VBS. 
or come on, or the, to, the, to the children's pastor, come on, then to the youth minister. We've abdicated our role as a spiritual head. But ministry starts at home, not at the church. Ministry starts at home, not at the evangelistic meeting. Ministry should start at home. That's the way God ordained it. And that's, the, that's why the enemy has been able to come and steal and kill and destroy from the home. Remember the book of beginnings. God was looking for a man. And he found Abraham. And this is what he said about him. I know him. I know him. But God's the only one, you said it earlier, God's the only one that knows all things. He's the only one, true, know-it-all. Right? Nobody else knows it all, but God knows all things, says the Old and New Testament. God knows all things. He knows, like I said, he got all of my message last night. He knows the end from the beginning. So he knows everything. And when he said, I know him, he really knew him. He knew what he was going to do. He knew what he was going to say. He knew how he was going to act. He knew him. And he said, this is what he said of him. This is Genesis 18. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. To do justice and judgment. Think about that. God knows you too. God knows me too. Are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? I mean, seriously, are we? So the thief, Satan, comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. Thank God that's not the end of the verse. I am come, Jesus said. I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. I've actually had preachers argue with me. Well, he's talking about heaven. <laughs> Did I miss something? You mean the thief is going to be loosed in heaven, stealing and killing and destroying? I think not. I think he already tried that and got the boot. No. He was talking about on earth. And that's why it's inferred, I am come to earth that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Here's the Greek word. Here's a Greek word, and I know you're taught well, but perhaps you're a visitor and you came to this thing and you're sitting there and you're really wondering why you came right now. What in the world are they doing to me? What I thought I had a friend. Greek word zoe for life. It refers to the God kind of life. Life as God has it. Jesus came to earth came to this dirt ball for one reason and one reason only to bring us life like God has so what in the scratch are we doing <laughs> really I'm, I'm serious I'm, I'm really serious I've been in 3,000 churches and that's conservative I've been in the ministry 43 years I've traveled to 32 countries. I've preached in 47 states. Eight out of 10 Canadian provinces. All through Mexico, Central America, South America, Europe, North Africa. What are we doing? What we don't realize oftentimes is the influence and the, the indoctrination of religion in our lives, in the church world. Wow. 
even in our kind of churches. My question is still, what are we doing? Are we serving God? Are we following Christ? Are we doers of the word? When I say we, I mean me. Because I'm accountable for me. Am I following God? As a husband, growing up macho, am I operating with the love of Christ, the agape love of God in my marriage and with my children? Am I leading them? And then the next question begs, where am I leading them? To what am I leading them to? Hello? Am I trying to build my own culture, or am I copying the culture of the world and bringing it into my Christianity? You see, I'm really serious about this. Why? Because I've done over 200 public school assemblies and 500 youth camps all over the world. And I see the casualties of war in our children. I see the devastation in their lives. And I see why that 88% number is real. Because they haven't been led properly. Pastor and I talked a long time at lunch yesterday. Our children and young people will go wherever they're led. That's why they get involved in all kinds of wacky, crazy, brain-dead stuff. Have you been to Philly lately? I was in Pittsburgh just uh, a month ago. Have you seen what's walking the streets of Pittsburgh? Have you seen what's in the malls and the restaurants? Our young people will chase this most whacked out craziness. Their hair, their makeup, their tats. I'll get to the girls in a minute. I'm serious. I landed at Milwaukee Airport three hours late last month. I never do this. I drove around. I'm looking for, you know, something. All I've done is eat pretzels on the plane all day because we're just sitting there and waiting for aircraft, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> Had to stay at the gate. Couldn't go to a restaurant in the, in the terminal. <clears throat> and so I'm looking for something, and all that was there was a McDonald's that was open. I never go to McDonald's. But I just ordered a drink and some fries. I think that's what those were. <laughs> I got to the first pay window. You know, normally they're standing there to take your money and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, verify your order. But this person was sitting there at the computer, hardly even looked out the window. Long hair, makeup, ball cap on, fingernail polish, chains, necklaces, breasts. But because I had a profile, Adam's apple was still there. Now they tell us that there's 52 genders. Yeah, that's the latest. It may have gone up to 62 by now. But now they want to teach this to our children in school. If you were to talk to a three and a four year old like they're talking to three or four year old, you'd be arrested. 
rightfully so. But because they're teachers' unions and because they are certified to talk to our children about gender dysphoria and their, their gender identity, they're allowed to do that without even telling and notifying their parent. That's why elections matter, guys. I said, that's why elections matter. And they're bringing this dysphoria, they're bringing this confusion to our children. That's why I said, the devil's winning. Trying to re-identify what a home is, re-identify what a man is, what a woman is, what a marriage is. Come on, are you kidding me? But yet, it's been passed into law, not just in states, but federally for our whole nation. That a man can marry a man and a woman can marry a woman legally and nobody can do anything about it. We're living in the last of the last days. Jesus said in Matthew 24, as in the days of Noah or in the days of Noah, so shall the Son of Man come and return. He's coming soon. But when I see that and I look that up, it says, let's just turn there. Let's just turn there. Am I helping anybody yet? Have I scared anybody yet? I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to, I'm trying to make sure you're awake. Chapter 24, verse 37, it says, but as these red letters, Jesus saying this, as in the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, so this is right before the flood, the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the, the day that Noah entered into the ark. Now why does it say eating and drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Wouldn't that be included marrying? First thing I thought. That's not what it's talking about. You look it up and you look at the history. And you find out very quickly they legalized gay marriage. Out of worship was already taking place. They legalized gay marriage. If you look, if, if you go back to the book of beginnings, Genesis, and you see the vileness, lasciviousness, the demonic influences, the idol worship, the ungodliness, the worship of animals, that happened before the fall of the Roman Empire. People are worshiping animals today. Talk about an endangered animal about to eat an endangered plant. People are worshiping plants. People are worshiping animals. They really are. Have you flown lately? And people got all their little foo-foos, and they got all their nails painted. And I mean, they're, they're decked out better than their kids were. They're animals. We're living in an unprecedented day. In our ministry, we have, we have uh, one, two, three, four groomers all work at the same place. Four groomers. The wealth of the sinners laid up for the just. They make a great living because people worship their dogs and their cats. And they pay an enormous amount of money to groom those animals to board those animals, and to cater to those animals. Me growing up early on a ranch, animals have a purpose. And when they lose their purpose, they become dog food. Yeah. <laughs> no, we don't have expensive vet bills. We don't get our animals neutered on the ranch by the vet. 
We need a five-gallon bucket and a sharp knife. That's all you need. Come on, somebody. And they will heal up just fine. In fact, better than from the vet. Let me explain that a little bit. The head goes in the bucket where they can't see and they can't get out of there the way you tie them in the bucket. And that's not a big deal to a cat because a cat likes buckets. The cat loves to climb and stuff. But anyway, they may not like you for a couple of days. <laughs> they may steer clear of you because you identify with something that's very painful. But they're hungry enough, they will come back when you feed them. Duh. But now we worship them, we bow down to them, and people spend Tens of thousands of dollars on their vet bills. We also have a vet in our ministry, so I know these stories. We're living in the days of Noah. Jesus could come that quickly. I asked the Lord one time, how long will it take to harvest the earth? Because I live in the number one ag producing county in the whole state of Texas, number two or three in the whole nation. We don't have trees where I, where I live because it impedes the growing of our crops. You know, this beautiful countryside and these rolling hills here in PA, where I live, they would knock down all those trees and they would plant corn there, plant beans there, plant something there. They're going to plant something there. They're not, and they're not going to let those trees steal the moisture out of the ground for their crops. That's their mentality. Of course, on the high plains of Texas, there's not a lot of trees anyway. I live at 3,500 feet above sea level. It's as flat as a tabletop. But underneath is groundwater called the Ogallala Aquifer. We're on the southern end of it. And the northern end is all the way to North Dakota. It, so it runs through all those states between us and North Dakota. And when they discovered that that groundwater is there and they started planting in this, in this fertile soil, <clears throat> it became this oasis. And so I know a lot about agriculture. I know a lot about livestock. So the Lord said, how long does it take to harvest a crop? When I asked him, how long does it take to harvest the earth? So he said, how long does it take to harvest a crop? I said, about a month. And he didn't say anything else. This is going to be a quick work. This is going to be fast. He can harvest the earth very quickly. But you know what? He needs laborers. Jesus said he needs laborers. So what in the scratch are we doing? Think about it. What are we doing as the church? You see, if we're not in the fight, that means we've already been captured. We're already woke. We've already become passive. Is that clock correct on the back wall? I'm going to break in just a moment, give you a break. And I hope you come back. I know I'm talking strong to you. But to get my point across, I have to. Jesus didn't mince words. So I'm not going to mince words. Look at Jude, verse 3 with me. And we'll, we'll, we'll wind this one down. So this Zoe life, that's what he wants us to walk in. The life as God has it. But yet, the church is not doing that. The church is just as divorced as the world. The church is just as drunk as the world. The church is, 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 is just as compromising as the world. Hello? Jude 3, Jude is right before Revelation. Jude, think about who Jude was. Jude was the half-brother of Jesus. 
So Jude knows, knows his business. Or as they say in West Texas, knows his business. And he said in verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the, of the common salvation, it was needful or necessary for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the, to the saints. What does he mean? Earnestly contend. Fight! What happens if we don't fight for the faith? We lose it. It's called the Dark Ages. Anybody know history? Where there were no Bibles? That's why it became a period of great darkness and gross darkness on the earth. It was disgusting. And they made movies about that time frame and that period. And I'll tell you what, most movies made today are dark. Most. Especially this time of year. Now you've got a whole month of these movies. Then after that, you got these, cre these cheesy Christmas movies that are going to come on. Some of them are good, but most of them are pretty cheesy. It's called the Hallmark Network. Sorry, ladies. You mean the Predictable Network? You mean the, the wannabe screenwriter network? It's pretty sad. But before that, you got all these horror movies, and now we have a, not just a month of them. Now you got regular series, The Walking Dead, The Living Dead, Zombie This, Zombie That. What in the world are we doing watching this as a church? It, does it surprise anybody why the spirit of fear gained such ascendancy in 2020 during COVID? The enemy has been preparing the earth with fear to cave to a virus that has a 98.9% recovery rate higher than the flu. But it's a virus. It's a pandemic. It's a killer. And don't say it comes from China. We don't want to offend anybody. And you need a vaccination. It's not really a vaccination. But we want it to be a vaccination. Just trust us. It's a vaccination. You don't need any mask. But now we need them. And you might need a second and a third one and a visor and a hazmat suit. <laughs> and you get the vaccination because it's going to restrict the virus where you can't contract it and you can't spread it. But then actually you can still get it. <laughs> And you can still spread it. It would be funny if I, if I was making this up. But that's what was really happening. And we give all this wonderful accolades. We've deified Dr. Flip-Flop Falsey. As God of these diseases. <laughs> and the whole time he's in bed with Bill Gates, who has used vaccinations to kill millions of African children. But our media won't cover that. How in the world was that perpetrated on American people? Fear. 
fear. Number two, because the American people have become spiritually ignorant. It doesn't even qualify for ignorance. It's missing some letters. Ignorant. <laughs> How many grew up hearing the saying, what you don't know won't hurt you? That's a lie. What you don't know can kill you. Ignorance can kill you. Amen. Now, don't misunderstand me. The virus killed a lot of people. But so did medical malpractice. The virus almost killed my brother. Now, li listen to me carefully. My brother pastors a church of over 15,000 in Tulsa, Jerusalem. Tulsa to the rest of us. My brother was one of the original honorary grads of Rama. He was ordained in the very beginning from Kenneth E. Hagin Evangelistic Association before there was a Rama. We've been around this a long time. We know faith. But his daughter had contracted, they're younger. I mean, they're in their early 20s. They contracted the virus and given it to him and his wife at Christmas, last Christmas. By the third week of January, my nephews are texting me and saying, Uncle John, we need your prayer right now. We, we've never seen our dad like this. He lost 40 pounds in two weeks. It wasn't water weight. It robbed him of all of his muscles. And let me tell you how muscular my brother was. He's four years older than me. Four years ago, when my brother was 66 my age, my brother bench pressed 550 pounds. So he had some muscles. Now he wasn't sculpting. He wasn't pumping up, you know, but he was really strong. And it stole them all. It stole his deltoids. It stole his trapezius. It, you know, that's the muscles that develop here. that connect your neck to your shoulders. It stole, it stole his biceps, his triceps. It stole his quads. It stole his hamstrings. It stole his calves. They said he looked like he was in the eighth grade. My brother's in great shape. He runs bleachers every day or every week. He still lifts. He does all that with his sports teams at his Christian school that they compete in the public school in Oklahoma, with the public school arenas in Oklahoma. But he does it to stay in shape for hunting. He's an avid hunter. He's on a trip right now to the Yukon or somewhere exotic, you know, Alaska or somewhere. He's gotten some, you know, nine, nine and a half foot brown bear. That's a big honking bear. That's not a bear you want to meet in the woods. And for any of those that are against hunting, if you don't harvest these animals, then by the way, you have to buy a tag to do it, to legally harvest it. They get diseased and they will kill the rest of the animals. They will kill the rest of the herd. And that's why you have so many deer carcasses on the road because they're not, there's not enough harvesting taking place in Pennsylvania, Iowa, and some of these woke states. And they get diseased. And that disease runs rampant throughout the, the, all, all the deer, all the animals, et cetera, et cetera. They need to be harvested. This particular bear was 25 years old. They study it by the teeth. They were all ground down. He was an old bear. He had scars all over him. He won many fights. But my, my point is this. My brother was in great shape. His team physician is the head 
surgeon at the biggest hospital in the state of Oklahoma on the hill at 61st and Yale. You know which one it is. And this is what he said to my brother and to his wife. I cannot put you in the hospital and give you what you need to survive. Think about that statement. I cannot prescribe for you what's necessary for, to heal you in the hospital. We put you in the hospital, they're going to put you on a ventilator, and you'll die in three days. That's from the leading surgeon. That's not from some woke person. That's not a conspiracy theorist. That's from the leading surgeon of the largest hospital in the state of Oklahoma. And that's been repeated over and over throughout America. Because of money. A lot of people died unnecessarily because they weren't given the medications, the minerals, the vitamins that were necessary to beat COVID and kick it in their butt. My brother was raised up in two weeks from the right medication, but primarily 85% of people that die from COVID or have severe COVID issues are deficient in vitamin D3. Take vitamin D3. I still take it. Zinc. COVID hates quinine. But you can't go and buy straight quinine and live. But you can drink tonic water that has quinine in it, safe levels of quinine in it. And so we, every day, take these supplements and vitamins, no drugs. My, bro, my wife and I haven't had any antibiotics or drugs in our body since 1981 when we were married. We've never spent a night in the hospital, a day in the doctor's office. We don't have to. We don't need to because God is our physician. Are you hearing me? And we trust him, but we do things proper naturally as well. We're not perfect at it, but we primarily fight that fight as well. Here's my point in saying all of these things. There are real devils out there and real diseases out there. And those cells, those bacteria come through in and through our bodies every day. We breathe them in, we take them in through our skin, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when our bodies are in good shape and we're taking the right supplements and nutrients and we get proper rest, but most of all we're believing and trusting God, they pass right through our bodies. Carcinogen cells are in our body right now, but they don't find a harbor when our bodies are healthier. We become too sedentary. We become too passive. We become, we, we, we're, we become too reliant on Tylenol and, and ethanol and all the nols. Ibuprofens, et cetera, et cetera, trying to manage our pain instead of dealing with the issue in the beginning at its root, at its source. I'm John George, and I approve this message. <laughs> I'll give you a break, but I want to finish what we're looking at here in this verse. We've got to fight this fight. We've got to fight this fight. The next verse says, but these, these other men were of this doctrine. They crept in unawares, making the grace of God and taking the grace of God and turning it into lasciviousness or lack of control. In other words, we can do whatever we want to do and still under, be, be under God's grace. Grace. You know what Paul said about grace to Titus? He said it, it teaches us that we're to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. That's what he said about grace. He didn't say live any way you want to live. 
Taste anything you want to taste. Drink anything you want to drink. Watch anything you want to watch and you'll be okay because grace. That's not what it says. I want to close this session by the mandate God has given me. This is what my calling is. To spark a revolution of righteous men. Revolutions are not easy. They're not easy to spark. But we've got to do it. Because my Bible says that he's, Jesus said this. Jesus, he quoted Malachi. Malachi or otherwise known as the Italian prophet Malachi. People are afraid of Malachi because they're going to receive an offering when they talk about Malachi. So it's Malachi. He said in chapter 4, he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the, children to the fathers as in the, the, by the spirit of Elijah. And Jesus quoted the same thing in Luke. That's not happened yet, but it needs to happen. And we need to be a part of that. Let's get in the fight. We didn't pick the fight, but bless God, we sure better finish this fight. Because he's not coming after a woke church. He's coming after a glorious church, a powerful church, a church of authority, a church of power, a church of wisdom, a church of prosperity, a church of blessing, a church of favor. Come on. Not, not a beaten down, afraid church running, for, running to the hills for the pandemics are coming. No, we're out front. We're leading like we're supposed to be. Amen? That's who the church is supposed to be. The church is not to take a back seat to the world and to the culture. We're supposed to be leading. Come on, somebody. We're supposed to be standing up to it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these men, for these ladies that are here today as well. I thank you, Lord, for the purpose, the plan of God. I thank you, Lord, for what Pastor shared last night about igniting and about getting on fire and about doing the right things and about, about leveling our lives and getting to that place, Lord. And I'm just bringing another word that will help level us up and get us where we need to be. Realize that we've been out of level and out of kilter and off balance. We've been all messed up and whacked out. But this is time to change. This is time to level up our lives by submitting to you and coming into a, a, under your authority and your wisdom and your power. And Lord, I just pray right now that you deal with hearts and you deal with heads. And these men make decisions, not just based upon what a man has said, or what men have said in the last light and today, but what you said in your word, because your word's eternal. And it shall not return unto you void, but it shall accomplish the thing whereto it was sent. In Jesus' name.